I will start by um, introducing our two, our featured speaker tonight, Rana. Um, this is officially a celebration of the publication of Rana's most recent book, Artifacts and Other Stories. And Rana will be reading one of the stories from this new book. And our other featured reader tonight is John Bendit, who will be reading um, from a work in progress. And I will tell you more about both of their bios in a minute. Um, I also want to thank Lee Woodman, who's mastering the masterminding the chat room. If all of you have comments or questions for the authors or comments about the discussion of writing later in life, put those in the chat room and Lee will oversee that. So we'll open it up for discussion after the readings. Um, and Lee is another prime example of someone who has turned to writing successfully later in life. Um, so we're going to begin with Rana's reading. And I just want to say initially that tonight is very special um, for me because, and I think Rana too, because Rana and I met decades ago in the early 90s at Breadlow, where again, as I said, we idolized and were so grateful to Hilma Wolitzer and Linda Paston. They were really our, I mean, we just looked up to them so much and we thought, oh gosh, we can have kids and be writers. And um, so I'm thrilled that Hilma is here tonight. Um, so we met there and um, I know that our younger selves would have just been so happy to have seen into the future and known that we would publish books and and be real writers. So I'm glad those that those dreams of ours came to pass. So all these years later, Rana is an award-winning author of three story collections, one of which, Second Language, won the New Rivers Press Many Voices competition, and a novel on Bitter Sweet Place, which won the Shelf Unbound Best Indie Book Competition. Um, she was also, she's also won, she's been awarded a scholarship in fiction from Breadloaf, a fellowship in fiction from the New York Foundation for the Arts. And she has also been, she, she was and remains the founding fiction editor of the prestigious Bellevue Literary Review. In her earlier incarnation, Rana was a public defender a lawyer with the Colorado Rural Legal Services and a lawyer in private practice. So we'll hear more about that transition and how it affects, affected, excuse me, affected her writing soon. Right now, I look forward to hearing Rana read an excerpt from Artifacts and Other Stories. Um, the story is called Woman Wanted for Travel, No Romance. And perhaps you can begin by telling us how this story came to be, how the book came to be a little bit. Okay, thank, thank you. First, I want to thank you, Donna, for the lovely introduction and for facilitating this. And also to thank everyone who's here on the Zoom, especially Walter Cummins, who's the publisher of Artifacts and Other Stories. Um, he's with Serving House Books. And also that Hilma is here, as Donna mentioned you, Hilma, were such a model to us, so it's terrific that you're here. Um, Artifacts and Other Stories is a collection of short stories. It was published in October, and the book explores the joys and limitations of love, the coming together and breaking apart of relationships, and the stories also look at aging and illness. Um, and some of the stories are newer and some of the stories are older. I chose stories that all fit together with that theme and I put together the book in that way. As Donna mentioned, I'm going to read a story from the book. I'm not going to read the whole story. I'll start from the beginning and then I'm going to jump to the middle just to give you an idea of the story. And oh, you asked, did you ask about how this, this particular story came about? Actually, also on the Zoom is a man named David Flitter, and he once told me that his father put an ad in a paper called Woman Wanted for Travel, No Romance. And I thought it was such a great 
a title for an ad and I asked him if I could use it as a title for a story. He said yes. And so I went and I wrote a story about it, not about his father, but imagining who this man would have been to place this ad. Woman wanted for travel, no romance. One. Eli Grossman had lived a good life. He'd been a grocer and had worked hard before he'd sold the business and retired. At 82, he was in relatively good health, despite the aches in his left knee and right shoulder, a few minor operations he'd endured, and the incremental loss of energy that came with age. He prided himself on his strength, independence, and stubbornness. He'd gone to college after World War II and won his wife's hand. He had he had turned his grocery into a thriving specialty store and pushed to buy a house in a good Chicago suburb so their kids could go to the best public schools. He'd even fought for and kept his sanity when Edith died six years ago. His son, Jonathan, who lived in Telluride, had called every day back then, encouraging Eli to build another life when Eli had given up hope. There had been tension between them for years, but Jonathan put that aside for a time in the wake of his mother's death. And miraculously, Eli had found a new life. He was traveling to Florida next week with a woman he thought he loved, a woman he was going to ask to marry him, Irma Leonard. Eli didn't use the word love carelessly. He had loved his wife, Edith, a love that shrank or stretched depending on the year. When she died, he'd fallen into a depression, but his determined will to survive had burst to the surface. Friends had told him about online sites where you could post a personal ad. Eli was stubborn and he supposed old fashioned. You didn't go shopping for love as if it were a pair of socks. But he started reading the ads in the local newspaper. And finally, three years ago, he placed his own. Wanted. What did he want? He wanted Edith back and life as it had been before. He sat at the kitchen table and tried different combinations of words. Finally, he settled on this. Woman wanted for travel, no romance. Widower, age 79, seeks female, age 70 to 77, for travel and conversation. He didn't want complications. It was too late for romance. What could he offer a 70-year-old woman? he decided he could offer her companionship, not a small thing. Besides, he had opinions about the world and he wasn't bad looking. He had a respectable head of gray hair, though his hairline was receding. His eyes were blue, his nose long, his height medium. He'd never finished college, but he'd taken classes at the community college after he retired. To his surprise, he received 10 responses. Irma was the only one who invited him to her apartment for dinner. She enjoyed cooking. Did he mind? He drove downtown to the sleek high-rise under Versi, parked and rode the elevator to the 12th floor. The apartment was elegant. Edith would have said so. Irma was attractive, a few inches shorter than he was, with wavy blonde hair, blue eyes, and a warm smile, a confidence. She wore a blue silk dress that draped her slim figure. They sat across from each other at the dining room table. At dinner, he asked her, so do you have any health problems? He didn't want to bring someone into his life that he'd have to take care of. I was going to ask you, Irma replied. My birthday was last month and I'm 70, but thank God healthy. They say 70 is the new 50. Oh, I have shoulder problems. Years ago, I had my appendix out. She laughed. It was an emergency, but I found I could live without an appendix. You can live without a lot of things you thought you needed, he said. He laughed too. Then he became serious. I'm in pretty good health. My cholesterol is good. Even my heart isn't so bad. He didn't mention the melanoma the doctor had removed from his cheek last year. He didn't tell her about the arthritis in his neck, his knee. The heart is the most important, Irma said. You look like you have a good heart. My husband died because of his heart. At 63, he was young, Eli said. Whole lives were reduced to this, he thought. A sweeping description and a lifetime was summarized and dismissed. Three months after he placed the ad, Eli planned their first trip. He and Irma had been out to dinner six times. 
At the end of each evening, he walked her to the door and formally shook her hand. Their conversations were pleasant. He decided he and Irma should go someplace domestic. What if in the end they didn't like each other when they spent more time together? He suggested New York. Irma was pleased with the idea. The airplane trip was uneventful. He booked a room for each of them in the hotel. It was January and chilly, but the sun was shining. A blizzard swept, swept over the city at the end of the week. That night, they ate dinner in the hotel restaurant. They sat in a booth facing each other. As they ate, Irma said, I think we should really try to get to know each other, Eli. I don't mean any entanglements or romance, but as people, don't you think? I thought we knew each other well enough, he said. Oh, we do, she laughed, but I meant to try to really understand the other person. She put her hand on his. Tell me about Edith, your late wife. We never talked much about her or about my late husband. Edith, he repeated, maybe it's better. She was a good wife, he said, a good mother. She helped in the store, she was. He stopped. She had been like another limb to him. She wasn't the best housekeeper. She didn't always like sex, and they argued about this. She was a bulwark against loneliness. He thought of Harry, the woman with whom he'd had an affair. It grated on him, this transgression. I'm not usually so clumsy with words, he said. And your husband, what was he like? Arnold? Irma smiled a whispered, wistful smile. He was the valedictorian of his high school. He had a brilliant mind, wasted it. He wrote wills and defended criminals. She paused. He was a philanderer. I see, Eli said, trying to take this all in. After dinner, Eli walked with Irma to the hotel's elevator. They rode to the fourth floor in companionable silence. Oh, Eli, she said, there doesn't need to be romance, but you don't have to be so formal. No, I suppose not. Would you like to come over to my room, he said, for a drink? Irma sat in the white stuffed armchair in Eli's room. He did something he'd never done. He telephoned room service and ordered two glasses of white wine. The space felt smaller with two people in it. There was no place for him to sit except on the queen size bed. I'm glad you invited me in, Irma said. I thought it would be nice to talk more. I don't want any regrets. Everyone has regrets, Eli said. Yes, she said suddenly. Let's be absolutely honest. About, he said. About our lives, Eli. What do you have in mind, he said. Let's play a game. Arnold and I used to do this. True confessions. First, I confess something to you that I might otherwise want to hide. And then you confess to me. Eli looked at Irma skeptically, but she was already at it. I confess to you that I wasn't always truthful with him. No, Eli said curious. He had not been entirely truthful with Edith either. I used to sneak a look at Arnold's mail, Irma said. If I held the envelope just the right way toward the lamp, I could read what was inside. It was a feeling I had. Eli nodded. Once I saw the letter was from a woman, Florence Magliocha. She worked in his office. A love letter. It was disgusting. I love you with my life, she signed it. Eli just listened. Irma's face grew blotchy with anger, so I pieced it together. I did something I'm not proud of. I had my own affair. You, he said. I'm ashamed to admit it, she said. An eye for an eye, he said. Would Edith have done the same? Then he laughed, not to make fun of Irma, but with pleasure. She was as human as they come. You're laughing, she said. No, not at you. It's nothing to worry about. Now it's my turn. I strayed with a secretary from a coffee company on a business trip. We're not meant to be monks and nuns. He didn't mention Harriet. It happens, yes, Irma said. I think it's wrong and... Enough with the confession and philosophy, he interrupted. Let's enjoy the night and the wine. Oh, Eli, come lie on the bed with me, will you? Or is it absolutely against your policy? She rose from the armchair walked to the other side of the bed and reclined on it, shoes and all, her dyed blonde hair shining like a crown against the pillowcase. He joined her against his better judgment. They lay side by side. Then she inched closer to him and he leaned toward her and kissed her. 
the past fell away. I'll stop there. Thank you. Can you show the book to us too, please? Oh, yeah, I have to get it. One oh, I'm, second. I'm no, one. it's right here. Oh, you do? Sorry. I have oh. right here. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. And um, uh, it's published by Serving House Books. And Walter Cummins is with us tonight. We're happy about that. And Walter is the publisher of Serving House Books. And he's a wonderful publisher. He took incredible care with the book, for which I'm grateful. So thank you a lot for reading. And we will have questions for Rana, excuse me, later, soon, about the story or about her earlier career as a lawyer as well. Right now, though, we're going to go to our next, our second featured reader, which who is John Bendit. And it was a nice surprise to me to learn that John would be reading with Rana because once again, uh, my many years ago, my path crossed with this um, with this author. I was a direct mail copywriter, and I wrote a couple direct mail packages for MIT's Technology Review, where John was editor in chief. Um, and so John um, has had a very impressive career as a science journalist, serving as editor at, Sci at both Scientific American and Science before landing at Technology Review. He is also now creating a very impressive new career as a writer. His novel, The Boatmaker, won the National Jewish Book Award for debut fiction and was quite favorably reviewed in the New York Times um, book review the, by the BBC, Publishers Weekly, Forward, and other places. Today, John will read an excerpt from his current work in progress. I'm fascinated by what I've read from this work in progress, and I'm eager to hear John speak. So, John, please Thank welcome you, Donna. Bend it. Thank you very much, Donna. And that is a nice introduction and also a nice uh, kind of coincidence that our previous lives did intersect as well as our current lives. It's funny, it's, it's something that Donna reminded me of uh, when we connected for this event, something I hadn't really thought about in a long time. So this is a piece that was published in the Northwest Review, which is a journal based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, it's called Memories of an Epidemic. Libra was difficult to manage. Everyone knew that. It was because he lived in two different worlds. One was the outer world of other people. Otto Rank, Freud's real son, says somewhere that reality is everything that resists a person's will. Reality, the world of other people, resisted Libra's will at every turn. The other world was the inner one. In that world, nothing resisted Libra's will. Then again, nothing in it was real. He was 40 years old. He had been writing since he was 16, and nothing he wrote had ever been published. His genius was unrecognized. The contrast between these worlds made Libra difficult to manage. He was obsequious in the face of the world, as helpless as if he was unreal, without power or form. At the same time, he had contempt for the world and everything in it, as if it was the thing that was unreal. He was above the world, mightier than it was, stronger than time. He never knew which attitude to indulge at any given moment. His life flickered between them, self-abasing and self-glorifying, high up and very low, full and then empty. Libra was a science journalist, an editor at the most famous science magazine in the United States, in the entire world. He didn't want to be there. It was part of the world he had contempt for. Science was no more than another religion, a cult whose priests wore long white coats. He knew that because his father was a scientist who thought human beings were machines machines made of molecules, organic machines. If anything was a religion, surely that was. Libra had contempt for science and everything in it. And yet he was a science journalist, 
an editor at the famous magazine with offices high over Madison Avenue in the heart of Midtown, offices filled with mid-century modern furniture and people who shivered with cultic feeling. Even there, he could not bear to be one of a crowd. The current that ran through him, surging back and forth between self-abasement and contempt for all that is, would not allow that. He had to be the best, and everyone else had to acknowledge it, or else there would be trouble. Usually, there was trouble. The famous science magazine was shuddering under the pressure of change, like an iceberg about to calve. It had resisted change for decades, preserving its appointed rituals with the greatest faith. But its founders had fallen out. In the oak paneled room at the Harvard Club where the editors had lunch once a month, the two founders presided at opposite ends of the long table, speaking in code, making hidden references to things that had happened decades before, stinging each other in the silences between the words. Mommy and daddy are fighting. The children sat there between them at the long table, eating the popovers the Harvard Club was famous for. All the children at the long table were editors like Libra and unfailingly loyal to one of the two parents, the founding editor in chief. They worshiped him. They thought the other one, the founding publisher with his bow ties, his sharp nose, his bushy eyebrows was a fool. He wasn't a fool, but the editors loved their leader the editor-in-chief. By the time Libra found a way to make everyone acknowledge his genius, the founding editor-in-chief was gone. In his letters to the scientists, who were the magazine's titular authors, he said he was retiring and mentioned in parentheses that he was 65, as if that explained everything. In fact, it didn't explain anything. The founding editor-in-chief had been forced out by his old partner, the publisher. The marriage had broken. Both men had gone outside the marriage to find other partners, outside partners who would buy the magazine they had founded together and force the other partner out. It wasn't a fair contest. The founding publisher was the savvier man. He came from an old rich family in St. Louis, originally German, Brewers. He was the one who had raised the money to launch the magazine in the beginning. He found a German publishing company to come in and buy everyone's shares. Not long after that, he forced his old partner out. After a short interlude, he installed his son as the new editor-in-chief. The son was not equipped to run a famous magazine. He wore a bow tie, as his father did, but he didn't have his father's wiliness or any part of his toughness. The son was a substitute, there only because his younger half-brother, son of the publisher's regal second wife, a smart, handsome boy and the obvious heir had gone off the road in his car and been killed on his way back to Harvard. Ordinarily, the magazine published eight articles on eight different topics, the topics chosen and balanced according to one of the secret formulas that formed the ritual heart of the magazine's being. But every year in the fall, it published an issue in which all the articles were devoted to one topic. In the days of the founding editor-in-chief when the magazine walked in glory, choosing the topic of the special issue was a jealously guarded prerogative held by the editor himself. In latter years, in conjunction with his chosen successor, the brilliant young newspaper man from Baltimore who had never been to college. The successor had come to the intention of the editor-in-chief by publishing a review of the famous magazine in the newspaper in Baltimore where he worked. It was a time when newspapers still mattered in Baltimore and in other cities. The article was written as a book review. The chosen successor wrote book reviews in the time he could spare from his job as a copy editor. The review brought him to the attention of the editor. It was a job application, the only one he needed. After the editor was forced out, his chosen successor lasted only one issue. He didn't want to edit the famous magazine, he said. He wanted to write a novel. Libra didn't think he had a novel in him. He thought the successor didn't want to sit in the seat of his famous predecessor after the editor-in-chief was forced out and the publisher was in charge 
with the new German owners to back him up. The successor didn't need to be forced out. He didn't fight. He went quietly, keeping his own counsel as usual under his prematurely gray hair. The publisher wasted no time installing his son, the substitute, in the editor's chair. From there, things went downhill quickly. Most of the older editors from the long table at the Harvard Club, the ones who had worked for the editor for many years and idolized him, resigned or were fired. Libra was younger. He also loved the editor-in-chief, but he wasn't as much in love with the magazine's rituals as his older colleagues were. Libra thought some icons were made to be broken. All icons, actually. Not that icons didn't serve a purpose, but when they had served that purpose, they should be broken. Libra didn't ag agree with his colleagues that the old editor-in-chief, elegant as he was, could never be replaced. Libra thought there was an obvious replacement. Libra himself, editor of the future. So he stayed and established an uneasy peace with the substitute. The substitute didn't trust Libra, but he had older, other older editors to deal with first. He thought maybe he could work with Libra until he had resolved his other problems. It was a troubled time. The substitute had the remaining editors line up and come into his office one at a time to profess their loyalty. The ones who wouldn't swear allegiance were fired. Libra didn't have trouble finding the right words. He even believed a few of them. The substitute was, after all, his boss, and to that extent he deserved Libra's loyalty, at least until Libra could find a way to unseat him, take his place, and make the world acknowledge his own genius. Thank you, John. Prime example of using one's earlier career in one's current writing. Wonderful. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. I know that um, you all, please, at this point, if you have questions or comments, put them in the chat, and we're going to open up for you all to um, communicate, too. But initially, I have a couple questions that I wanted to pose to Rana and John. Um, to hear their answers about um, the topic of the evening. So, Rana, let's go back to you. Um, Thank you. Your first career was as a lawyer and yes. public defender. And you want to tell us a little bit how, um, tell us a little bit about that career and how it might or might not have affected your writing, your creative writing, and whether you were writing creative pieces while you were a lawyer. Thank you. I, when I was a public defender, I represented clients who were charged with crimes. And it was a very diverse population and that people couldn't afford to hire for an, an attorney. Um, so I represented them and I, I did many trials. I went to trial many times. And actually being a trial lawyer is a little like being a fiction writer. Not quite. You can't make everything up, but you do put a particular spin on a case to try and, you know, draw the jury into your world, your worldview about the case. Um, so I saw people who were really in crisis and who had different kinds of emotions who were um, just in very difficult situations. I also did civil work with Colorado Rural Legal Services. So that I feel like that emotion helped me in terms of writing fiction, having seen so many different types of people, worked with them, and experienced their reactions uh, was very helpful to me. Also, some of the times I use law for a character. Some of my characters are lawyers. And that's the case in artifacts and other stories. I chose law for a profession because I thought it suited the characters and I thought it deepened the stories. And also I know that world. So it was useful in my fiction. When I was working as a lawyer and especially as a public defender, I was always doing creative work. I was always writing, although there wasn't a lot of time for it. But I used to stay at the office late and, you know, they had a very fancy typewriter and I would use that to write things. And um, I didn't really submit much work. I did submit a few poems and I had a couple of poems published and I submitted one story and that was eventually published. 
Um, but law is so encompassing that there wasn't a lot of time for writing, basically. And was there one, th and was there one thing that led you to stop to make a transition to writing full time? Well, I always wanted to write, and um, when I was in my mid thirties, I went to a writers' conference in Aspen. I was living in Denver at the time, and I'd never been to a conference. And at that time, I had two young children. In fact, my youngest was an infant at that at that moment in time. And the workshop instructor said that my poems were like stories. And she suggested that I take a class in fiction writing at the University of Denver. And she said to me, you'll progress faster that way if you take a class. So I did take some classes at the University of Denver in fiction writing. And the more I did fiction writing, the more I enjoyed it. And I was really inspired by those classes and by the experience of writing stories to um, make a switch. So I eased out of law. I also had three children at that time, and I decided that I would ease out of law and take care of my children and write. But again, when you have young children, there's not a lot of time to write, but there was more flexibility than if I were practicing law for full time. Yeah. And did writing legal briefs affect your writing today, do you think? Well, in a sense, it probably does. When you write a legal brief, you have to be very, very precise. It's very technical, but you have to be articulate and precise. And so I've probably taken that precision and translated it into fiction writing. Um, I, I try to be precise about words and um, how I express things. And that's probably from my background as a lawyer. I also feel that you as a public defender, that's a heart-centered job in many ways. Yes, and yes. that that comes through in your stories and novel as well, that your care, you, all of your, there are very few villains in your, in your writing. You show a lot of heart to your characters. Thank you. Um, and let me switch just for a minute to John and, and if you can speak to us for a bit about how being an editor and a science journalist, um, how that affected your, we, we hear here in the last piece you read, um, your feel, possibly your feelings about your former career, but can you tell us? A little <laughs> well, more? some of, yeah, some of the feelings about my former career come through in that piece. And I mean, the thing about being a science journalist for me was that I, I always wanted to be a writer. I had been writing since I was probably 15 or 16, but I didn't, there, it was very difficult, for me, it was very difficult to find a way to become a writer. And uh, I'm not sure why that was. We, we probably don't have time to go into all, you know, the, the deep Freudian reasons why that was the case. But the, the, the bottom line was that I found myself in a career which involve writing as an editor, but which was not being a writer. And I felt a lot of conflict about that. And a lot of the conflict is what comes through in that piece uh, about uh, about being a science editor. It's about, it's not so much that I think there's anything wrong with being an editor or a science journalist. I, I think it's a fine thing to be. It's just that it wasn't what I wanted to do. Yes, yes. And that, I think it's what comes through in that. And you mentioned that conflict. I felt something so similar. I felt exactly the same thing when I was a direct mail copywriter. I went into it because it was a writing job. Yeah. And but I was like, this isn't quite it. This isn't what I really want to do. Yeah. And there's something that um we don't get in the piece that you read, we don't get the point at which Libra leaves mm -hmm. that career, that industry, but uh, or that field. But is there anything that prompted you to finally make the leap? Well, I mean, at, at a certain point in life, I mean, we talk, the theme of this is emerging later in life as a writer, you know, our lives are limited, right? We only have a certain amount of time here. And there comes a point where you feel like it's now or never. Uh, and so what happened, uh, Donna, you and I knew each other when I was the editor in chief of Technology Review. And that was the last job I had. That was the last, you know, real job I had with an office and a boss and a, an institution. And when I got to the end of that, the point where I really felt I had to leave, uh, I knew that I didn't want another job. And so what I did was I set up a consulting business 
that built on what I knew about science publishing. And that was how I lived and supported myself. And that gave being a consultant rather than having a job gave me a lot more flexibility and time to write. Yeah. And so then really I kind of reversed the polarities of the way that I was living and the writing became the most important thing. And the consulting was done as a secondary thing to support myself. Yes. And that, in, in the end, that worked. That was what enabled me to write The Boat Maker, which ultimately got published. Yes, yeah. And, Rana, you mentioned, um, I think you mentioned something about The Office, or maybe we were talking about it earlier before we began. We officially started this evening Zoom. But I know that in my own career as copywriter and writer, I've gone through a lot of different technologies, starting with an IBM self-correcting typewriter, and I was thrilled with that. And but we've all three of us have had to go through, um, have had to learn how to use new equipment. And I wondered if you wanted to talk either, Rana, let's start with you if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I also just wanted to segue back to what you were saying. I felt the same way about law and writing legal briefs that I was doing writing, but it wasn't creative, it, it didn't have any spirit for me, so it, it wasn't that satisfying. Um, but regarding the the different tools, I've adjusted to the different tools. There have been many different tools. I think we were saying, which dates us, that I was saying at one point I had to use carbon paper if I wanted to make copies, you know, when I was using a typewriter. But I've certainly adjusted to using a computer, and a computer is very efficient, and it makes it easy to write and revise. On the other hand, sometimes I think that the computer makes it almost too easy. For me, I can write on the computer and it's and it reads better on the computer to me than when I look at the hard copy. So there's almost an illusion of things being, you know, very smooth and finished on the computer when in fact they aren't. Um, but on the other hand, the efficiency is, is wonderful. So much easier to revise, yeah. It's much easier to revise. And although on I was going to say, on the other hand, sometimes I wonder if in the old days when you when I revise, I'd had to I'd have to retype the whole thing. And when I retype the whole thing, I would get new ideas and I would make other changes. So there is something to that. And I suppose one can retype a whole piece on the computer. Yes. Yeah. And John, any comments that you'd like to make about the tools you've used? Well, yeah, the only thing I'd like to add to what uh, Rana has said is that uh, when I so when I set up the consulting business and I really decided that I was going to put the primary emphasis on writing, doing my own writing, then I went back to working in longhand and I wrote the boat maker entirely in longhand. Oh, my wonder. Interesting. You know, so I was taking a step back. We had, you know, we've all gone through all these sort of evolutionary stages in technology. And then I decided it would be much better for me as a writer to go back to writing in longhand. Yeah. So the boat maker was written, the first draft of it was the first drafts of it were written, you know, on uh, Xerox paper with pen. Fascinating. Lined paper? No, unlined. Okay. Yeah, fascinating. Um, uh, like Spalding Gray said that the pen should be an extension of your musculature. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think there's something to that. I think that it's a more physical activity. Yeah, I I also write longhand. I I don't write directly on the computer. I write a story longhand, and you know, for on bittersweet place, I wrote the chapters longhand, and then I transfer it to the computer. And I always do the revising on hard copy, and then I transfer it to the computer because I I feel more in touch with the work when I'm when I can sort of feel it when it's very tactile. Cool. Interesting. You both must have better handwriting than I do. Um, well, I, I can read it. That's the only, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the only, that's the only requirement. Yeah. So um, just um, one other thing that's different from years ago, certainly, is that authors, we have different tools. We also have um, pressure to be on social media. Um, and I wondered, and we also now currently are facing this looming specter of artificial intelligence. And I don't know if, you know, this chat GPT-4 <laughs> that's out. I mean, it's quite daunting in some ways. It's quite fascinating to me what's going to happen with all of that. And I wondered if, if, Rana, let's go back to you first. Comment if you have comments about your use, your 
you know, your use of or dislike of social media and anything about AI? Um, well, I think social media, yeah. thank you. Yeah. I think social media is here to stay. And um, it's important for writers. You know, it, it enlarges one's audience. And um, on social media, I learn about different events and different opportunities. So it does expand my world as a writer. On the other hand, it's very time consuming. Um, I, I feel it's essential, but it's it's time consuming. Even keeping up with emails is time consuming. And I find that social media is also distracting. So social media can distract creative thought. So for me, I have to do it in blocks of time when I'm not working on a story. Because if I go back and forth, I find my energy and my attention and creativity diluted by social media. Yes. Yes, I agree. Yes. And John, any any comments from you on? Oh, I don't. I don't have too much to add to what Rana said, which I think is quite all quite apt. Okay. Anything about AI? About AI? No. I mean, I'm the last person to ask. Even though I was okay. the editor of a magazine about technology, my uh, one of the ironies of that job was that my staff all thought that I was a luddite. So. Okay. All right. We'll we'll skip that then. Um. Um. So actually, I think. I think it's time to open it up to the audience and question. I'm, I know there are some of you in the audience who are in careers that you want to switch out of or any questions you might have for Rana or John about their writing um, or their, their current or earlier work. Uh, let's open that up. Lee, where are you? Do you have anything to share with us from the chat room? Yes, um, there were two questions. One was already answered, whether uh, Rana and John write longhand first. So that's been answered. The other question was, can John speak more about his novel in progress? Is it a novel of ideas? Well, uh, novel in progress. So I, I have two things that I'm working on at the moment, as a matter of fact. And one is, that this piece called Memories of an Epidemic is kind of the germ of a memoir, which is about exactly the subject that we're talking about, which is about becoming a writer, right? Be having one career and becoming a writer. So that's the germ, this, this piece, which is written in the third person, pro the, the person will probably change as the manuscript is revised, but it, that's the germ of a memoir about that the exactly what we're talking about tonight. So that's one thing that I'm working on. The second thing that I'm working on is a, no, a second novel, which is both a standalone novel and a sequel to The Boat Maker. So th those are the two projects that I have in progress. Cool. And and Rana, will you tell us about what you're working on now too, please? I'm writing more stories and the themes of the stories are an extension of the themes and artifacts and other stories. And I've also written a novel about a public defender who is representing a client in an insanity case. And the novel is really about um, the rule of law, the criminal justice system, and the insanity defense. And I've gone back to revising that. It needs a lot of revision, but I've gone back to working on it. Another question for you, Rana, is, um, uh, it seems like you really like to write stories rather than novels. Could you comment? That's from Audrey. Oh, um, I do like to write stories. I like um, I like the precision of a story, and I like being able to deal with different kinds of characters in different situations. Um, I like the brevity of a story. I like trying to capture a moment in people's lives. Um, I also find it easier to hold a story in my head than a novel. A novel is a, a, a long, long time commitment. So mostly I've written stories, but I did, I loved writing the novel on Bittersweet Place. It, it took many years, but I enjoyed it. And when I began that novel, I thought of it as um, linked stories. And after I'd written a number of stories, I realized I had enough material for a novel. So I changed it and turned it into a novel. 
Great. For both of you, John and Rana, do you think starting at, out as a writer later in life has made a difference in how you approach your childhood and early life experience? Do you write about your early life as much as writers who started out younger? Let's go to John first. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And um I would say I, it's very difficult to answer. I think sort of, you know, it's difficult to sort of look at yourself from the outside and think about that. But I do think that The Boatmaker, which is my first book, first published book, my debut novel was published when I was 66 years old, right? And I do think it has a different perspective than someone who was started having a first novel published at 25. I think it's less overtly autobiographical. I, and I do think Part of that has to do with age and a little bit uh, more distance on my own life that gets sort of digested and metabolized and emerges in a different form. Whereas I think that many writers, who, if, if I had been writing at 25, I think I would have written something that was more obviously in a linear way autobiographical. Yes. I just wanted to throw in, I had written down this quote from Nikki Giovanni, you still bring to bear all your prior experience, but you are writing on another level. It's completely liberating. That applies to what you just said, John. Um, other questions, please. Donna, what about you? Uh, yes, I thank you. I, yes, I also think that's an interesting question. I think as, a, as an older writer, a more mature writer, my concerns are different than when I was writing when I was younger. And so my stories are different, and even the novel is different than it would have been if I wrote it when I was younger. Um, it's just uh, experience and just the kind of issues that I think about, you know, as I'm growing older. So I think it has an effect. I can't really tell you specifically where, but I think generally it does have an effect. Another question from Hilma. Will either of you revisit characters from earlier fiction? Rana? Um, thank you, Hilma. In terms of revisiting characters, meaning write again about the same characters, that's what the question sounds like. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I will. Uh, sometimes um, I use a character who's similar although not always the same. Although recently with the stories that I've been writing, I've been writing stories about the same characters. So they're new characters, but I keep revisiting them in different stories. John? Yeah, well, for me, the answer is yes. As I said, one of the things that I'm working on now is a second novel, uh, which I hope will be published at some point. And that is a, both a standalone novel and a sequel to the first novel, The Boatmaker. And it has as its central character, the character who was at the center of The Boatmaker. Um, and the sort of interesting thing about that is the, it, the character is both the same and very different. So it's a kind of a yes and no answer, but in, in the kind of, in the sense that we're all very different. Uh, as we go through life, we become very different people. But but in in the obvious, you know, factual sense, it is the same character. Thank you. This question is from Yassim in Turkey. She says, as a junior researcher in the academia, English literature, I would love to know whether you have by any means resisted ageism in publishing as well as the literary world. John? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not on a personal crusade to resist it, but I, I mean, just I think just to get published, is, you know, to get published at 66 is a kind of, you know, quiet, passive resistance to ageism. <laughs> and Rana? Yeah, I haven't, I can't think of a very specific experience of ageism, but I agree with John that being published, you know, later in life as you're older and more mature is a kind of resistance. I do feel that um, the themes that I write about are probably more of interest to more mature readers than to young editors and young writers. So um, I'm not sure my stories would be of interest to young editors of literary journals, not every young editor, but in that sense, ageism might, might be happening. I don't, I don't know. 
And here's a question from Susanna. In today's politically correct world, do you feel you are in any way holding back in what you would really like to write? What a great question. Great question, yeah. Ron, I want to hear from Ron about that. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I, I do feel that way. In fact, in this manuscript, I had some um, sentences that the editor um, pointed out might not be politically correct you know, different things that I had characters saying or thinking. And so after I thought about it, I took out some of them. I, I I think about that now in a way that I never did before. So yes, I think it does hold me back somewhat. Interesting. I, I, my answer would be that I hope not, uh, that I try, you know, I'm trying to write what I want to write. I mean, one of the one of the benefit. I mean, there there are a lot of uh, drawbacks in a way to be emerging as a writer later in life, which is the theme of this conversation. But there are also benefits, and I think one of the benefits is that there's a kind of liberating quality to that, where you don't have to worry so much about what other people think. I mean, I think that's one of the benefits of aging in general, to be honest. And I, I, my answer is that I hope not. I hope that I'm not holding back. Here's a question from Jetsana Venkataraman. Can either of the panelists talk about the pros and cons for a budding author getting the books published in the traditional way versus online publishing as an ebook? John? Well, I, I guess I don't have, I mean, I'm not sure that I'm in a position to give advice to somebody uh, as somebody I'm a relatively new author myself, but I personally, and this is a purely a personal preference, I still prefer books, the actual physical object of the book I like very much. And that may also be a, a reflection of age, you know, but I, I still think there's something very valuable in the physical object that is a book. And I think there is something, you know, I, I think, this this great value in certain kinds of digital publishing, but I still prefer books. Rana, I also agree with John. I really prefer books to um, um, an online um, or a digital book, and I think that's like John because of my age. However, I would hope um, that digital books are as recognized and you know are given the same respect that a real book is uh, so that um that there's no real difference if a person decides to publish digitally i think we should go back to donna uh, those are the questions on um, the chat and you know i think you should wrap it up with your own questions sure um um, one of the things that I've always thought, I published my first book in my 60s as well, after publishing stories and poems, you know, individually and, and never getting around to really putting things together into a book, so, or submitting it as a book. Um, um, but one of the things that has always, I always looked at the author photos on the backs of books and looked to see how they are. Oh, I still have time. I still have time. Right. And then, and then as John said earlier, there comes a point where we realize we don't have all the time in the world anymore. And, um, um, so one of the things that has always encouraged me is that we're not basketball players, we're not football players, and as long as we keep our wits about us, us writing really is something that we can do into the future and um you know Hilma Wolitzer here tonight is a prime as a fantastic cheering example of that having you know uh, Hilma's first story in the Saturday Evening Post was today a woman went mad in the supermarket and just I believe maybe two years ago I'm not sure exactly if you want to chime in Hilma please do but um later in life and I won't say the exact age but it's later in life and and a book she has she had a new book come out that had both new fiction and her older fiction including that first short story she published i was 91 donna 91 all right awesome I'm now 93 
Right. Amazing. Oh, all right. So here so you go. I just wrote you a note saying you so-called older writers seem like mere kids. To me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank You're you very fertile and you have lots of work ahead of you that I look forward to reading. Oh, it's wonderful. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, let's see, Rana, going back to this most recent publication that, that we're here to celebrate, is there anything else that you want us to know about this book? And um, or um, Yeah, the, the book, um, as I said, it spans stories that I wrote over a long period of time. So actually, the oldest story in the book I wrote 30 years ago. And the newest story I wrote about three years ago. But when I put together the book, I revised every story in it, even the stories that had been published. Some of the stories had been published already. Um, I did that because when I went back to my older work, I felt it needed revision. And I also wanted to be sure that the stories fit together um, and that the themes fit together and that there wasn't repetition. I interestingly had found that I repeated images and I didn't wasn't even aware of it. So there was an image in the story from 30 years ago that I used in a story a number of years ago. So um, it was an interesting, it's almost like the unconscious has a will of its own. My unconscious was at work using these images, but I wasn't aware of it. So I had to make sure that there wasn't repetition in it. And again, I can't speak highly enough about Walter Cummins and Serving House Books. They, he and, and Serving House Books was wonderful to work with and took such care with the manuscript and gave me such helpful feedback. I'm very grateful to them yeah. and to him. And I urge everyone on here to buy Rana's latest book and early, earlier books as well. Her website is listed in the chat room. And John's website is also listed. I urge you to buy both of their books. And um, um, just, I also wanted to share one more quote before we end. Uh, Muriel Spark said, be on the alert to recognize your prime at whatever time of your life it may occur. Yes. So just kudos to both of you and um, all of us of, of different certain ages. So, um, be well, and thank you all for coming. Yes, Rana, it's Louise. Hi, Louise. <laughs> Louise was in a writing group with me. Oh, yeah. wonderful. And Louise is a writer, a wonderful yeah. writer. Wonderful. And just one more thing. Ellen Barber had a question oh. for John about his central character, so I encourage you both to talk to each other um, by contacting. Will, again? Will, will you be doing this, hosting this again, Donna? Um, hadn't thought of it, but not really, but we are recording it. So I can send you the recording. And if it's all right with John, I can send you his email address. Yeah, it's fine. That's fine. Okay. Perfectly. Thank right. you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for thank the wonderful you. questions. And Donna, Lee, John, for being here, for your reading, John, for your facilitating, Donna. Congratulations. Bravo to all three of you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. thank you. And congratulations to you, Lee. Lee's most recent poetry book um, won a prize with, with the Independent Press Association. Is that? Yes. Yes. And you Which published is three or four books after four. age 65, right? Four books. So thank you for mentioning that. Yes. Yes. There's lots of energy here. So we'll keep on going. And Hilma, thank you for being with us. Yes. Yes. How wonderful. All right. Thank you all so much. And good night.